behalf of Lauren and Nate, thank you so much for joining this warm December afternoon. As they celebrate one of life's greatest moments and give recognition to the worth and beauty of love as they join together in the vows of marriage. You may be seated. Lauren and Nate, to make your marriage work, it's going to take love. Love should be the core of your marriage. Love is the reason that you're here. But it's going to take trust and dedication and faith. And it will take commitment to hold true to the journey you both are pledging now to share together. So, do you, Nate, take Lauren to be your beloved spouse, knowing in your heart that you will be a faithful friend and a loving companion? On this special day in the presence of your family and friends as witnesses, do you give your sacred vow that you will always be with Lauren and support her in times of sickness, in times of health, in times of joy, and in times of sorrow? Do you promise to love her completely, to console and comfort her during difficult times, to laugh with her and to grieve with her, to be truthful and honest with her, and to cherish her for as long as you both shall live? Nate, if that is your promise, say I do. I do. So, Lauren, do you take Nate to be your beloved spouse, knowing in your heart that you will be, a, be his faithful friend and loving companion? On this special day, in the presence of your family and friends as witnesses, do you give your sacred vow that you will always be with Nate and support him in times of sickness, in times of health, in times of joy, and in times of sorrow? Do you promise to love him completely, to console and comfort him during difficult times, to laugh with him and to grieve with him, to be truthful and honest with him, and to cherish him for as long as you both shall live? Lauren, if this is your promise, please say I do. So then who gives this woman to be married to this man? Well. It is always a privilege to be asked to officiate a wedding ceremony since it is such a beautiful picture and illustration of salvation of what God has done for us through his son Christ. It's even a higher honor to be able to stand before two young people, as special as these two, who are surrounded with their family and friends. It's an honor these days to stand before two young people who are doing things right, who have kept themselves for each other until tonight. In fact, it was 10 days ago, Nate and I were talking on the phone. And I said, Nate, I don't know how you feel about these kind of things, but I had a dream last night. Remember, this was 10 days ago. And I said, Jesus is coming in two days. <laughs> and he said, PJ, we better get married tomorrow then. <laughs> I thought it would be appropriate to remind them right now, but mostly Nate, that I had been planning a hunting trip to Nebraska this month. <laughs> but I came here instead. So when you and your dad and family go on those elk hunts, I expect a phone call, okay? In all seriousness, I am so thankful for this opportunity. Julie and I are excited and happy for you, and so is our church back in Unison. I've chosen somewhat of an unusual text for this wedding. It's in John chapter 21. It says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. So he said to Peter, Tend my sheep. And then Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, then feed my sheep. I have officiated enough weddings to know that the words shared by the pastor are rarely remembered and most often are not even being listened to while they're being said. <laughs> But I thought if I used a passage that talked about farm animals, 
<laughs> fishing and campfires, that maybe these two would listen for just a few moments. <clears throat> now what is this, this text saying? Well, we know it took place just a very short time after Christ arose. The men had went out fishing. They weren't sure what to do. They weren't even sure what to think. Their master had been crucified. And they were processing all this. And Peter, as their leader, says, I'm going fishing. And the other men followed him. And they went on the boat. And as we know, as we sing that little Sunday school song, they fished all night, but they caught no fishes. And Jesus hollered at them from shore, Hey, guys, cast your nets on the other side. <clears throat> and they listened, thankfully. And we know that they pulled out 153 fish. That is the first time a scripture fishing and told the truth, Nate. <clears throat> we know that after they got back to shore, Jesus had already prepared breakfast, a breakfast of fish, which is, which is cool. They had a campfire there. And so often when we think of Bible characters, we, we paint them in this light that is unrealistic for us. But just imagine these men who had shared three and a half very special years together. <clears throat> and now they're by a campfire telling stories probably amazed at this crazy catch of fish that was impossible for them to even get into the boat. I think about the fellowship that they were sharing and that love that was being expressed. And in the midst of this, then Jesus turns to his disciple Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? He says it to him twice. Some people believe he asked him three times because he denied him three times. We're not sure. And I will save you a lesson in Greek because I'm really not that good with it, but I understand this passage enough to know what Jesus was saying. Peter, do you love me? Then prove it. Don't just say you love me. Live that you love me. Show that you love me. It had been just a few weeks since Jesus had spilt his lifeblood. And he had given his life for Peter and all of mankind. And now Jesus was just testing Peter's resolve. Jesus had sacrificed his life. And he wanted to know what level of seriousness, what level of commitment that Peter would have. Anybody can say I love you. But to live I love you is another story. We need to love Jesus with our lives, our actions, our sacrifices, our language, our attitudes. And Nate, as I just shared with you and your, your groomsmen, the best thing you can do for Lauren is to love your God. The best thing you can do for your future children, if God wills, is to love your God and to love your husband. Anybody can say I love you. It seems really easy today, in fact, all you have to do is hit hashtag, love you lots. Or we don't even have to say it. We can just put an emoji with a little heart blowing out. Anybody can do that. It seems like it's become such a cheap word. Anybody can say it. But there are very few in our society that are actually following through. What does living I love you sound like? It sounds like keeping God first place in your home. It sounds like listening to each other with your heart. It sounds like never criticizing each other, privately or publicly. It sounds like praying and reading God's word together. It sounds like never making choices that would cause your spouse to question your loyalty. It sounds like seeking opportunities to serve each other by putting the needs of your husband or your wife in front of yours. Selfishness is at the heart of every failed relationship, guaranteed. But selflessness and sacrifice are at the heart of every relationship that thrives. You need to love each other with a biblical kind of love. You know, as Christ was hanging on the cross, his first words were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is amazing love. All the power in the universe, the, the power to call down 10 legion of, of angels and end it. But he hung on the cross. He gave his life as a gift for us. His life was not taken. It was given. That's why he bowed his head and then gave up his spirit. It was a gift for us. That is love. In fact, biblical love is the love of loving. It's being in love with the process. Maybe not with 
the product or what is returned to you. Biblical love is a not because of kind of love. Because Nate picks up his socks and his undergarments, I'm going to love him. Because Nate provides a living or because she makes a nice supper for you or she lets you go hunting or something like that. And yes, it is how it works. She will let you <laughs> go. <laughs> it's not a because of kind of love. Biblical love is an in spite of kind of love. It's easy to love people when you're being loved. But that love that Christ had, that was the most incredible display of biblical love that we'll ever see. And that's the kind of love that you need to pour out on each other. Because anybody can say I love you, but to live I love you is another story. And because of that kind of love, the kind of love that you guys believe in, you're going to choose to illustrate that with a very unique ceremony this afternoon. So Lauren, why don't you pass off your flowers? And I'm going to ask your friends, Scott and Debbie, if they would come and explain this for us. In John 13, 1 through 17, Jesus washed his disciples' feet and instructed that we should do the same. Lauren and Nate have decided to start their marriage together with this symbol of humble love. Lauren washing Nathan's feet, or Nathan washing Lauren's feet, says, <coughs> I love you, shows that you honor and respect your spouse, demonstrates a humility of heart and character, kneeling before your spouse, communicates, I will be there for you through the muck and mud of life, and places you in a position of prayer, on your knees, a great place to be in marriage. On the flip side of this, Lauren and Nathan, allowing the other to wash their feet, says, you are loved, shows you can receive your spouse's support and won't go it alone. Communicates, I will let you help me. Lauren and Nathan wanted their first act of service to be serving each other, following in the footsteps of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
perhaps for some of you that's the first time you've seen something like that being done and what a beautiful expression it is at a wedding ceremony of selfless love, of sacrificial love, I want to serve you. And I appreciate that. There's special things that you don't get to see, but you do get to see by being up front. Uh, you didn't see the goldfish that the groomsmen put in the water. <laughs> I'm assuming it was the groomsmen and not the bridesmaid. <laughs> Good friends. <laughs> Along with the washing of feet, they also are going to exchange vows, and they have written them for each other, and they're going to read them at this time. take you, Lord, as my wife, to love you and to serve you, to lead you and grow with you in a Christ-like way. I promise to protect you and lay my life before you, to think of you and your well-being before myself. I vow to love you the same way that Christ has us, to follow God his example of selfless and unconditional love, and to love you like Christ loves his church. I vow to make it my responsibility to provide for you to see to it that I place you before myself and provide for you physically and provide the spiritual and mental encouragement for you when needed. I promise to make our relationship the most important relationship on earth and maintain it more than trucks or four-wheelers. <laughs> more than earthly wants and desires. I promise to serve you through good and bad, through enjoyable times and miserable times, to pour my love into you so that it spills out into others. I vow to make God our number one focus and to walk according to his word and above all other worldly wants. I vow to love you, to live and love you according to his word. Nathan James, I vow to be your wife. Through God's grace, I promise to love you and be faithful to you always. I vow to be a helpmeet for you, to help strengthen and comfort you, to encourage and uplift you, and to cheerfully serve you. I vow to actively die to my selfishness and embrace oneness, to forgive constantly and respond to you with vulnerability. I vow to be on your team, to support you and stand up for you so that through our union we can accomplish more for Christ's kingdom than we ever could alone. I vow to accept my role as a reflection of the church and to accept your role as a reflection of Christ, to honor and respect you as the head of this family with the goal of giving the world a clear picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I joyfully give you my life and in confidence submit myself to your leadership. They've also chosen to exchange rings as a sign of this covenant today. So Nathan, would you slip her ring on her ring finger and then repeat after me? Just as the circle is without end. Just as the circle is without end. So my love for you is eternal. So my love for you is eternal. I'm giving you this ring so we never forget. I'm giving you this ring so we never forget. Lamora, place his ring on his ring finger. Repeat after me. Just as this circle is without end. Just as this circle is without end. So my love for you is eternal. So my love for you is eternal. I'm giving you this ring so we never forget. I'm giving you this ring so we never forget. <coughs> I'd invite you if you would bow your heads and your hearts as we go before the Lord. Father God, we thank you for this beautiful picture. We thank you for giving us a reason. Thank you for Christ, the example, his love for the church, and this example that Nate and Lauren have chosen to follow. Lord, I was so moved by their vows. Would you help them to never forget? and to follow through on them, even when it gets tough and when there's temptations to love self more than each other. 
Would you protect their home from immorality and divorce? Would you prepare them? Would you use them, Lord, as Lauren has said, to make a difference in your kingdom? God, I pray for your blessings on this new home. Prepare Nate for the heavy responsibility, Lord, that you have now placed upon him. Provide for them, Lord. Use them. We thank you for this special day. In Jesus' name, amen. In so much as the two of you have agreed to live together in holy matrimony, you have promised your love for each other by these vows, foot washing, and the exchanging of rings, by the power given unto me as a minister of the gospel, and the temporary privilege of doing a wedding in Virginia, <laughs> I now pronounce that you are husband and wife. Nathan, you may kiss your bride.
But guys, I just want to take a minute because I think I'm responsible for this marriage here. Lauren, just kidding. Lauren came home from Sarah Mead's wedding completely ecstatic. She was like, I think I met this guy. He's really sweet, he's really funny, and he invited me down to Louisville. Louisville, how are you And I think we're going to see fireworks. She's like, I'm not sure if I should go. Like, it's a big step. I'm going to have to drive all the way down there. I'm like, well, you never know. Like, try it out. Guys, she came home and she's like, I'm going to marry this guy. And she did. But she came out to visit me in Alaska this summer, and the whole week she had no phone service, which, of course, is the first time she had talked to me in four months. And the whole time we were there, she was going on and on and on about how much of a wonderful God following a man he was. And I only met him once or twice. And Nate, I just wanted to say, I'm so thankful that you're the person who's taken my sister's hand in marriage. So thankful that you honor God in everything you do, and how you treat her, and how you love her and protect her. And I'm so thankful that all the nights we stayed up and talked about guys, so one in the morning, or watched the movies and said, oh, one day I want that, that you've given that to her. And that there hasn't been endless nights of tears and drama and problems, but you've been her true protector, and you've been there for her. And I can't wait to see you guys grow together. And I'm so excited for you one and that you found me and that he can be that crazy, wild, but also humble and protective guy for you. And I just love you both so very much. And I will be down very soon to visit and to go more really and everything else I'm going to do. <laughs> So normally I prefer to wing speeches, but I figured this one was a little more important, so I wrote it. Um, so obviously my brother is Nate, and so I'm qualified to give this speech. <laughs> so anyway, um, ever since I've known Nate, which has been my dad, um, he's always been an all or nothing kind of guy. Like, everything he did was done to 110%, whether it was building Legos or bike riding. His Lego ports were always bigger and stronger. His bike ramps were always taller and his tree ports were always higher than mine. Nate has never done anything halfway, which my broken bicycles can attest to. <laughs> <laughs> Along with his full board energy, Nate has always been a competitive guy. He always wanted to be the best at whatever he did. I mean, Michaela and I have been dating almost a year before him and Lauren were a thing. And now they're meeting you at the altar by about five months. So Lauren, as long as you're willing to buckle up for the ride, which it's too late to back out at this point, so I'm sorry about that. If you can hold on, I know that he will always do his best to provide for you and tackle any difficulties that may arise. His competitive spirit will always lead him to fight off any other men, and he will always be working to be the best employee he can be, both to his work boss and to you, because you're the boss now. <laughs> I pray that he will always seek to lead you towards the Lord and strive to be the best husband he can be. If our first 20 years have told me anything, I have great confidence that your marriage will be great. Wild and really fast paced, but it'll be great. Love you guys. David Carmichael will open us in prayer. Look at the caterers just another minute or two. I won't pray too long, <laughs> but uh, we would like to thank you all for being here. And uh, we're excited to see Nate and Lauren growing, and uh, uh, it's just been a, a real blessing to see her come into Nate's life. Um, Christy and I are so relieved we don't have to watch over Nathan anymore. He's not going to be dropping by for dinner. And, you know, we get to have the house to ourselves again. So uh, he sort of left, but then he kept showing up again every night after work. So uh, we're glad we'll have a reason to go home now. And that's the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity that we have to to gather together, to, to break bread together. I thank you, Father, for the example you've given us 
of what love is, that is Jesus Christ and your love. Lord, we know to love means sometimes you get hurt. You knew that when you sent your son. You knew what it would cost. And yet he came. He lived and he died for us. Father, I pray that as, as Nate leads his family, and as Lord loves Nate, that they would keep that example in mind of what love is. Not holding back, not begrudging, but loving with all of their hearts, Father. Lord, we ask that you bless us through our bodies now. We thank you for all those that have, have come to be part of this meal, this first meal with this wonderful cup. In your name we pray.
of applause for Lord and her father. Now up Nate and his mom come out. Thank you. 